<laughs> thanks a lot for organising, Daniel. Pleasure. Uh, and thanks for coming, of course. Uh, yeah, it's what I think is a really important, um, but also uh, very, you know, malleable issue. We can do a lot here. It's something that is, you know, having severe impacts on birds um, and other biodiversity in a roundabout way as well. Um, but it's also something that is the direct result uh, of our own choices in managing the landscape. So it's something that we can really easily start to reverse. And I'm hoping that this uh, presentation will sort of give you all practical advice and allow you to <coughs> read landscapes. There's lots of different reasons that miners have thrived and lots of different reasons that small bushbirds in general have crashed. Um, uh, and, and what I'll do is go through some of the different sites, a really varied range of sites, and try to interpret some of the stories going on there. And you'll hopefully be able to apply those to the kinds of things that are happening here. Now, the area that I mostly operate in is in the inner southeast of Melbourne. And we are further down that traje trajectory of loss than you are here. So you've got a, basically a bigger window um, to save things. You've got more here than we still have there. You, it's, it's more like what, say, the Bayside area was in like the 90s, um, which is a great position to be starting in. Um, noisy miners really took off in, uh, in our area around the 1990s. They first were seen um, in the late 80s. And through the 2000s, things kept changing. They were still invading new areas and still increasing in number to the point where um, we lost those last few smaller bush birds that were still hanging on, you know, and seemingly coexisting with them for decades. Um, to the point where now most of our parks, it's nearly impossible to see a bird under 60 grams, which is the weight of a minor. Um, and I'll go into depth on that. Um, this is the Elster Creek area. And that's a sweet bursaria, which a lot of people, you know, on a surface level, they assume plant things with spines to help small bushbirds. That's actually the favourite nesting tree of noisy miners. So there's some nuance that we can work through that'll hopefully help. Um, now, I'm sure a lot of the people in this room are kind of aware of the state of our environment, but it is good to just start with, um, you know, where we're at and, <clears throat> and work from there, I suppose. So I won't dwell on that. Um, now this was a white-winged triller that um, tried to move into the Elstermick Park Nature Reserve. It's now the Yellicott Willem Nature Reserve. Um, it's one of those sites where no birds under 60 grams occur, except for welcome swallows, because they never stop moving. Um, and yeah, it was a migrant, came in in November and spent about two weeks just getting absolutely hammered, flying from little dense pocket to little dense pocket with hordes of miners um, following it. And eventually we found it bald headed and, and dead um, after the miners had um, caught up to it. So I, I suppose I better do a bit of convincing of the, the issue here, you know. Um, <coughs> another classic, I was, I was asked uh, to come in and look at Boyd Park. It's an area where there's been uh, some dieback of, um, uh, or decline rather, of some of the old red gums that have been there for decades. Um, and it seems that noisy miners are probably having an impact there in that they're pushing out a lot of those smaller birds that really do a lot of the work in controlling um, insects in the foliage, um, particularly the sap sucking insects like psyllids. So that's caused the trees to decline in health. And going there, the reason I call it Void Park is because beautiful old red gums should be full of pardalotes, not a sound, should be full of white plumed honey eaters, none of them there for at least 10 years. Um, and then beautiful old creeping mistletoes where the fruit just fall to the ground uneaten. So there's habitat there. It's not, that's not the issue. Uh, the noisy miners are the key issue there. Um, this uh, was a little, uh, it'll only go for a few seconds, so I'll, I'll just introduce it. Um, it was for a little catalyst documentary on the Yellicott Willem Nature Reserve, just a small segment of that doco. Um, and I put a little dead pardalote in a tree and played some calls of a pardalote and you get to see the response. <laughs> 
don't necessarily it'd be so meta if I was talking over my own. <laughs> but um, but yeah. So <clears throat> what should be a really common little bush bird and a doing a perfectly normal thing, just calling in a tree, um, not the kind of thing you'd think was a, a lure to, you know, elicit a strange sort of response like this. But oftentimes. We don't see these interactions because noisy miners are so influential that we don't even get to see them pushing out birds because they've already done it so comprehensively. So this was just a way of you know, displaying what these birds actually go through. <laughs> Just yeah, making sure it's definitely dead. Yeah. So I should also say at this point, people often blame common miners or Indian miners for this sort of behaviour. Has anyone ever seen that? No, nor have I. Um, it's, it's just a misconception. It's probably to do with the similarity of the names and the fact that common miners do compete with some hollow nesting birds aggressively but as do other hollow nesting birds that are native as well, just like rainbow lorikeets, which are actually far more abundant than common miners anyway. So a bit of a negligible issue uh, in relation to this. Uh, this was some data that I teased out of some um, all round um, bird surveys uh, at Gasworks Park. Thankfully, um, the crew that were gathering this data um, started, luckily just before noisy miners really moved in uh, back in, in 2014. And noisy miners are this blue line here. That orange line is the abundance of white-plumed honey eaters. One of the major competitors with noisy miners is a, a really intense battle in some parks between those two species. But white-plumed honey eaters generally on the losing end, as you can tell. <coughs> I did mention um, introduced birds. Um, it's just a nice little video of a uh, common blackbird and a brown thornbill being very peaceful together. <laughs> um, yeah, so we often you know, implicate just by assumption these other things in the declines of small bush birds. And while they do definitely have a role in certain cases uh, and to certain degrees, uh, I found that uh, in most situations, it's very hard to detect the impact they're having relative to noisy miners. Uh, and I'll look at some of that data in a sec. So. Um, here is just a general look at a really wide range of habitats. Uh, so you can see, you know, there's, there's like dry uh, sclerophyll woodland, you know, out, out on the peninsula, sort of uh, wetter um, heathy woodland, temperate rainforest, <coughs> very open, almost mostly grassland with a few scattered trees. A really wide range of habitats. A bit of grassy woodland there too, which is something that we think always must have noisy miners. Not true. Um, and a bit of heath. They all look fairly similar in the breakdown of birds under 60 grams to over 60 grams. So it seems that in most terrestrial habitats, it is normal for small bush birds, as we might call them, to, to be really dominant in terms of the, the species diversity. Um, when we move to areas with noisy miners, it completely turns on its head. It's a really, really strong, strong impact. Um, and some of these are remnant um, indigenous vegetation. George Street Reserve was the absolute worst site I've, I've seen. Uh, and it's beautiful remnant heath, uh, almost weed free. Um, and uh, same goes for Bay Road Heathland Sanctuary, and I'll talk a bit about why that's a very slight outlier, still a pretty desperate situation. But really these are your classic, uh, what some people call lollipop parks, where you've got eucalypts over lawn, and that's about it. Uh, this is, I think, a useful way of sort of gauging the situation. Feel free to, you know, as, as Daniel suggested, call out critique, ask questions, happy for all of that. But this is just something that I, I thought might be useful. Um, don't know if people can read right out the back there. 
but we've got sugary exudates. So it could be nectar, could be lerp, um, could be honey, yeah, well, honeydew, lerp, same thing. Um, it could be manna as well. Um, coverage and quality of refuge and lawn. These seem to be three things that really um, hold a lot of importance for noisy miners. That line there is sort of where you get noisy miners. It, it's of course really subjective, but this is just a way of assessing um, by eye what you're looking at. Applying that to a few sites, you start to see how uh, these different factors interact. So the, uh, the northern end of the St Kilda Botanic Gardens is primarily introduced trees that aren't pumping out a lot of those sugary exudates. The southern end is eucalypt dominated. But otherwise, structurally, they're very similar in many ways. Same amount of lawn, same amount of understory or lack thereof. And yet you see this disparity in noisy miners. Less of them in the introduced trees. Um, <clears throat> now this is something uh, that I think is particularly important. We have this bias in the way that we um, set up our landscapes from a tree perspective. Um, well, firstly, we, we think about trees more so than we think about other forms of plants. Um, and then also we have a, a disproportionate planting of eucalypts. And then in the genus eucalyptus, uh, we tend to go for this one subgenus much more than the other. And that's sort of been a, a blind bias for a really long time. Um, but I did a tally of planted eucalypts in southeast Melbourne and found that out of 50,000 planted eucalypts, 49,962 were all one subgenus, which is really weird because a lot of areas throughout Greater Melbourne, especially a little bit on the, on the more moist eastern side and in the southeast, would have had a lot of things like eucalyptus radiata, um, eucalyptus cephalocarpa, and up here a couple of other stringy barks and, and ashes as well. So they're all in the monocalyptus and we're just completely neglecting them in our plantings. And it just so happens um, that in this particular study by Wojnarski, um, he found that lerps were six times more abundant on Symphia myrtus, the one that we're planting uh, all the time. So it just shows that you can be planting indigenous trees while still having perverse outcomes if you're not planting a balance. And then there's a bunch of other things that come into it as well. This is one that I'd love to see used a lot more, Cephalocarpa. Um, it, uh, it seems to have quite a dense canopy and that sort of weeping habit uh, doesn't produce a lot of lerps. And I see a lot of birds that don't usually associate with eucalypts like brown thornbills or silver eyes using Cephalocarpa um, when they don't usually use things like red gums and others. So uh, probably one of the least helpful eucalypts for noisy miners, but that's still, that's still a eucalypt. So there's a lot of other things we can plant and I'll hopefully remember to, to touch on that. Um, so the other thing was, oh yeah, I should, I should stop there. This is also in the St Kilda Botanic Gardens, but it's the northeast corner of the St Kilda Botanic Gardens. So we're really <coughs> zooming in here. And this is the only part of the gardens that still um, serves as a uh, bird migration hotspot for small bush birds. They used to stop off right throughout the gardens where there, there was a bit of, you know, dense shrubbery. Now they've been pushed right into the northeast corner. Um, so bird watchers go there in the spring and autumn to find things like rose robins and rufous fantails and both whistler species um, use this spot, even though it's 100% exotic. It's obviously not going to be as good for them in terms of the food abundance as if it were indigenous, and I'll go into that. But structurally, it's at least giving them a chance to, to stop and rest. Um, so 0% noisy miner in that particular corner, which is pretty amazing given, it, given it's bordering on you know, noisy miner uh, areas up here. Um, and it, it is 37% small bush bird under 60 grams, but it's only brown thornbills and white browed scrub wrens during most of the year. So that's discounting those exceptional times when we've got migrants stopping off. Uh, and that displays that lawn has a bit of a role to play as well. Um, so I wonder if I can actually skip forward. I'll, I'll play this if I can skip forward because it's a bit long. Uh, 
but so noisy miners are one of the very few honey eaters that actually feed worms to their chicks but I can't think of anything else they obviously walk really well on the ground there you go that one's feeding worms um, they do a lot of their foraging on the ground uh, unlike a lot of other honey eaters um, yeah that's it's it's weird, isn't it? And also, you'll notice it actually flies over that dude there. He spots something on his shoulder and has to flick it off with a stick, which is... <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty stoked when I saw that. Um, <laughs> and teasing out the, how important lawn is for them uh, took me to interesting places. So, white-plumed honey eaters were once the most common uh, bird in local parks in my area. And that's actually not that long ago, but it was before noisy miners really took off. They're a eucalypt dependent uh, bird, just like noisy miners, but they don't interact with the ground layer almost at all, whereas noisy miners are quite reliant on, on lawn. So funnily enough, the places that white plumed honey eaters have persisted is not in the parks, uh, but in car parks mostly, um, where you've got eucalypts planted over pavement. And that's because it seems noisy miners don't infiltrate these areas very successfully. Um, so they're actually providing a refuge for white plumed honey eaters now. And this is just the breakdown of that car park from a habitat perspective. Uh, so obviously very high on the sugary exudates being pretty eucalypt dominated. Very little coverage of refuge, almost nothing, but no lawn. So that puts it about there. So it works well, this thing, I feel. Um, <coughs> then structure and refuge. Um, this site was uh, one of the really interesting ones, I thought. Um, it's Cherry Lake in Altona. Your classic kind of, you know, our, our typical park-like landscape of lawns with eucalypts scattered throughout. And true to form, noisy miners moved in there probably within the last five to ten years they really took, took over. But the, the lake edge is uh, a totally different structure. Uh, it doesn't have these, these tall trees. It's got a few taller trees, but surrounded by a skirt of, of lower vegetation. And in particular, there is those sort of um, blobby things you can see through here, a tangled lignum, um, which provides just about the best structure you could possibly want if you're a bird escaping a larger aggressor. Um, this site, <coughs> interestingly, uh, functions in much the same way as that, uh, the Cherry Lake site, where you've got um, small bush birds doing extremely well in here. Like the most common bird in there is superb fairy wrens. Um, the most common bird out here, rainbow lorikeets and noisy miners. So this is in Royal Park where it, it's 180 hectares of just noisy miner heartland. It's just perfect for them, but they've not managed to infiltrate this tiny little pocket. So we often think to have a meaningful impact, things have to be at a huge scale, but it seems like quality really comes into it as well. Um, so this has staved off invasion really successfully. So you can see the stats there, 0.8% noisy minor because they occasionally come in in little parties. 72% um, under 60 grams and 8% introduced birds. So found this pattern again and again where the small bush birds, birds were doing really well. You also had them coexisting with a a wide range of, um, uh, and, and in a fair abundance, uh, introduced birds. So seeing coexistence as, you know, a sign that they can, they can live together, um, <coughs> that I thought was interesting. So that's the breakdown of, of Trin Warren Tambour. And again, it's lignum um, making that difference. Um, and that's a, a view of what it's doing. So. I have chosen to use lignum um, in a, a project that I'm working on, uh, the, the Yellowcote Willem Nature Reserve, even though it's probably um, maybe 5, 10 k's from where lignum would have originally actually occurred. So it's not strictly indigenous to that area, but given the current context, it's probably one of the most useful tools from a purely structural perspective for turning the tide on, this, on these declines. So that's a dilemma for everyone to work out themselves, I suppose, and talk about as well. But my take on it is if we want to you know, restore ecosystem function, 
in some shape or form, we might have to actually think about things really pragmatically. Um, and that's just a look at its structure there. I've got a question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because um, they invade in from, does the group Bushman and it's taking images and invade in from like promoting areas or whatever you want to call them? So does the plant a barrier around Bushman about the fishing coming in? Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, I might actually just go back to this and this to help answer it. Um, this area is a fairly stark boundary. You don't get a lot of small bushbirds moving out in that direction into the, uh, you know, the, the good noisy minor habitat. The interesting thing here at Trin Warren Tambor is it, it actually is skirted by red gums and yellow gums over lawn, which should be fantastic for noisy miners. But it, it is such, um, in such close proximity to this ring of lignum that you can go there and you watch things like New Holland honey eaters and um, uh, what else, white plumed honey eaters, um, fairy wrens, all moving out from the lignum. If the noisy miners come, they just move back in and basically they use all of those resources in the surrounding area to the point where probably it's not very good habitat for noisy miners anymore, even in those eucalypts around the outside of the lignum. So the way I'm connecting that to your question is uh, it seems like when you have very high quality structural refuge, you rather than having noisy miners infiltrate the small bushbird habitat, you get small bushbirds, in some cases, actually moving out into the open. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Yep. Um, this might be of interest to some people. It's just a few cases where uh, a particularly good structural refuge has allowed coexistence with an otherwise overwhelming threat. Uh, and I've just gathered some examples of that. So obviously the lignum in, in those two examples was um, <coughs> providing habitat for small bushbirds to live very close to noisy miners, not quite coexisting because noisy miners actually get out competed by the small bushbirds and don't want to live in there. But in these cases, in, in cases of predation rather than competitive aggression, you can get uh, southern brown bandicoots um, doing extremely well in the uh, blackberry lined ditches um, in amongst foxes and things like that. So I think um, actually southern brown bandicoots in this particular study in the Mount Lofty ranges were six times more abundant where you had blackberry. And that's because it was providing um, a, a high quality structural refuge from foxes. Um, so these are the kinds of things which are really worth considering. Um, a really interesting one down there as well. Uh, the last place on mainland Australia where eastern barred bandicoots occurred outside of fences uh, was in the Hamilton rubbish tip where they could hide in car bodies. <laughs> <coughs> so there you go. All right. Um, might actually skip through those. I'll talk about them as I go. So this was, um, this is at Trin Warren Tambour. This is what I was talking about with the uh, various small bushbirds that get shelter from the lignum and move out into what looks like perfect noisy minor habitat. It was very hopeful to realise this um, because it shows we can have our typical parklands, tweak them slightly, still have the same uses in those spaces, but allow small bushbirds to return potentially. It's pretty adaptable um, and there are other plants I might mention as well that can work as alternatives too. So there are some indigenous plants which are going to function really well. Um, while we're on it, I might just mention um, it seems that there's a few structural elements of a plant that really makes it either useful or, or otherwise. Um, to have a fair bit of body to it is, seems to be pretty important. So lignum clumps reach, you know, when they're grown sort of three or four metres across. Um, whereas having, you know, even the same structure, but on a smaller scale, you can imagine <coughs> 12 noisy miners chasing something into that. It's just not going to work as well. Um, people often just go for anything spiny, but things like um, Acacia verticillata is a, a very upright kind of a plant. <coughs> it seems like a lot of these cases of, of small bush birds doing well around noisy miners is where you've got a lot of ground hugging structure, that sort of domed shape. And um, 
The other thing is something like Acacia verticillata. It's spiny, sure, but its, its branches tend to diverge a lot and it's actually fairly open in a lot of cases. Um, something like lignum or something like hedge wattle, Acacia paradoxa, has that sort of convergent structure where the branches turn back in on themselves and actually create a really good sort of cage. So there's those sorts of differences there that I think are really important. Um, although I haven't tested it and it's just, it's just an idea, um, I like to, you know, just to help people visualise what shrubs might be doing that job and what, what others won't, um, is get a golf ball and a tennis ball and drop them both into the shrub. If the golf ball falls through, the tennis ball gets stuck. You know, that's like a proxy for a noisy miner and a smaller bush bird. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, this is a really important thing to, to stress as well. Um, and a lot of the rest of this will follow on. <clears throat> is that it's not the plants themselves that are really doing the work in discouraging the noisy miners. Noisy miners will quite happily live in areas with a lot of understory, as long as there are none of those small bush birds to outcompete them. So there's actually a battle going on between noisy miners and their competitors, and the plants kind of mediate that battle. They decide who wins, but really we need to see it uh, as uh, as the small bush birds having an important part to play. And this is sort of uh, maybe a useful way of breaking it down. So anything that a noisy miner chases, you can think of as a target. Um, and I should say, for anyone who is not familiar with them, their entire life strategy appears to revolve around excluding competitors. Um, they've even been seen chasing a can that's blowing down the road. <laughs> they, they will chase everything. Um, and a lot of those things are not direct competitors, but it's so ingrained in them that they'll, they'll basically chase anything that they can, they can move on. Um, it's something that they invest a huge amount of energy in. Uh, <clears throat> and I've broken down the different targets um, to understand how they're impacting on, on the noisy miners. So thinking about things from the miner's perspective a, a little bit. So both pardalotes and white-plumed honey eaters, they eat the same foods as noisy miners, which already makes them a, a pretty impactful enemy. But then they also, what I mean by running competitors, is they don't actually seek shelter usually when they're getting chased. So if you've ever watched a pardalote getting chased by noisy miners, it'll just fly up higher and higher into the air until the miners eventually give up. So that's a really energy intensive kind of situation for both parties. Um, and at some point, the noisy miner makes the decision that it's not worth its energy anymore and it goes back down um, if they don't catch the pardalote. Hiding competitors, things which again, often eat the same foods as noisy miners, but require that shelter to get away to. Um, in terms of decoys, that's just things which don't eat the same food, but do elicit that aggression. So things like mistletoe bird, willy wagtail, not eating much of the same food. Um, but really, if you've got an abundance and a range of these, things just become less economical for the noisy miners. Once they've moved all those competitors out and they've got all the extra resources that those competitors aren't taking, but they're also saving all the energy in not constantly chasing them away, it's obviously going to be a much easier living situation for noisy miners. Um, you can also think of it as once the noisy miners move out the first and most sensitive species, say, for example, um, house sparrows seem to be particularly sensitive to noisy miners. Um, yellow rump thornbills do too. They should probably be in this category. Once they start to move out those really sensitive species, more pressure mounts on those fewer that are remaining because more of the aggression can be applied to a smaller pool of targets, if that makes sense. And what you find down our way, where it's really at a terminal situation, is now when you get one white-plumed honey eater or um, unlucky uh, white-winged triller moving into a park, the whole horde of noisy miners descends on them. And it's very difficult to, to turn that situation around. Um, this just shows how annoying pardalotes are for noisy miners. Um, because have a look at the, the rate at which it is scraping lerps off of those, off of those leaves. 
This is what the noisy miners are, are carefully farming, essentially, on, on those leaves. And uh, Pardalite's just going in there and raiding their, uh, their farms. <laughs> and also being very hard to catch um, uh, and not requiring shelter. Pardalotes are, uh, are, are fantastic to have around. Even though they don't require the shelter, if there are no other targets in that, in that area, that means more pressure is going to be on them. But if you can start to get a situation where you've got other, other birds that are targets for noisy miners, you might start to see the pardalotes slowly infiltrate. Things get harder and harder from there for the noisy miners. So to do that, you obviously need the incentive for birds to be moving into these areas. Um, and using examples from the Yellicott Willem Nature Reserve, I can only really speak to observations, although I've made lots and lots and lots of them over years now. It would be really nice if more formal work was done on this, but I'm hoping that I can offer you, you know, useful things that you can take and, and, and use to interpret. <clears throat> so we have um, taken so far about a three hectare piece of a golf course and revegetated it in a, a fairly unusual sort of a way where we've focused very much on the ground layer so far. We have not done much tree planting at all. In fact, we've done none. Um, and that's what we've, what we've produced over a really large area. Um, one of the unexpected outcomes of that, we had a new bird arrive, starlings, right? Which most people wouldn't be very happy about. Um, but <clears throat> we had a unique situation where what was lawns before, fantastic for noisy miners, also not bad for starlings, but we didn't have them there before. We actually irrigate our plantings because we've got stormwater running through that we can use as much as, as, as we like. Uh, and that has, has increased the moisture levels in the soil. There's now an enormous amount of invertebrate activity in the top sort of five centimetres of the soil to the point where you, any, you can walk around anywhere there, scrape some mulch or scrape some soil aside and it is crawling with worms and curl grubs, uh, which is exactly what these starlings like. So we've had a, a flock of about 50 starlings move in and they probe the ground everywhere because of this really abundant food resource that is a result of the structure of the plantings and also, funnily enough, the irrigation. Uh, noisy miners are having a really hard time moving the starlings on. They're, they're in this cohesive flock um, and they try and try <laughs> but the starlings just settle down again. There's so much food there for them that they, the starlings are willing to put up with this aggression. Um, and of course, at the same time, the noisy miners have also lost their foraging space on the ground in the form of lawns. They've still got it very nearby, but they've lost it in that immediate area. So the, the sort of issues are doubling up now, mounting for the noisy miners. And the starlings, they settle down and it's, it's now a an ongoing issue that the noisy miners can't really budge them. And because of that, we've started to see things creeping in, not in any serious numbers, but certainly a turnaround. So I've been watching this site intensely for 12 years now, almost 12 years. And I'd seen one golden whistler in there in all my time actually land. And it landed for about two minutes before it was chased out. I've seen a number of other golden whistlers where you'd see them try to fly in and before they even land, they get pushed out. This golden whistler just recently stayed for about five days um, in the exact same uh, shrubs and trees that were there before. Nothing's changed as far as the golden whistler is concerned. We've also had things like goldfinches, of course another introduced bird, but one of those birds that's particularly sensitive to, to this sort of aggression. We've also had green finches um, and brown quail move in as well. So we've now got two resident brown quail in what was um, just two years ago a golf fairway. And the brown quail, I haven't yet seen noisy miners um, respond to it, but when we've had other ground foraging birds move in or try to move in in the past, we had a common bronze wing uh, one day that turned up probably from the south of Bayside and about 12 noisy miners uh, attacked it and it, it didn't last long. <clears throat> I've also found dead uh, a dead brush bronze wing there, which I suspect was killed by noisy miners too. On that, you know, just bumping up the food resources, the incentive for these targets to keep moving in and, and living in the area. We're also playing around with planting mistletoes. And uh, if anyone uh, is, is sort of new to that idea, there was a study by David Watson 
um, who's, a, who's, who's done fantastic work on mistletoes. Uh, he's, a, he's a great ecologist. Um, he ran a study which for three years surveyed birds in a bunch of woodland plots around Albury that had a lot of mistletoe. Then they removed all of the mistletoes, at a lot, as a lot of land managers would do, um, a lot of farmers for example, 38,000 mistletoes gone from these woodland plots. They then surveyed the birds for another three years <coughs> and charted a 34% decline in woodland resident bird diversity, just from the removal of mistletoes alone. And even he was surprised by that, I believe, because it wasn't just the birds which preferentially feed on mistletoe fruit or nectar, or those which preferentially nest in mistletoes, which went. It was also, and actually most notably, that impact was felt by birds which feed on invertebrates in the soil. And, and they are also, as a group, as a, an ecological guild, ground foraging insectivores are probably the fastest declining you know, group of, of birds in our area. So things like babblers and button quails and shrike thrushes and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> and that then set off a whole other line of inquiry uh, where they found actually the, the leaf litter under uh, mistletoes hosts about 1,120 extra arthropods per square metre because of the extra leaf litter that the mistletoes are dropping and also the fact that, that, mistle that yeah, the mistletoe leaf litter is heavily enriched with nutrients. So it creates a real hot spot for biological activity. Um, but even just that the accumulation of leaf litter. A, a tree with just 10% of its canopy made up of mistletoe drops twice the amount of leaf litter. Um, so they have a really big impact on the amount of food output for most birds. Of course, insects and arthropods are what really drive terrestrial food webs. They're the main linkage between plants and the rest of the food web. And of course, um, we're seeing massive insect declines too. So that's, that's one lever which we can pull to, to turn things around. I think I've already had that, um, but I might just mention the other impact of having extra birds in the system, particularly small bush birds, native small bush birds. They tend to, uh, especially at certain times of the year, um, gather together in mixed flocks where they become a lot more cocky, I suppose. So to give you an example of what I mean, uh, in this particular site, Brown thornbills for most of the year stick to the safety of the understory, the really dense pockets. You see this in a lot of places, birds, uh, small bush birds, especially where there's aggressive honey eaters around like noisy miners, if they're there at all, they'll be hiding away and actually uh, often not in very high quality habitat in terms of food availability, but high quality structure. When we get grey fantails moving through and pardalotes up here, the brown thornbills expand their foraging area to, the, to make use of a much wider range of foraging substrates. And so you can see the sort of snowball effect of having more and more birds uh, of that size around. Um, just in terms of sort of planting structures, I think this stuff will be useful for you guys. Um, you see a lot of this in parks, I reckon, where we, where we tend to divide up like working, usable public space and then like a bit of bush or or a formal planting or something like that and in those plantings they yeah they tend to have this very hard edge <coughs> which actually works very well in noisy miners favor um, whereas when you get a situation like this where you get a sort of skirt of um, of descending height in the vegetation it actually becomes a lot harder for noisy miners to defend <coughs> So I should, maybe the next one, no, I'll, okay, I'll just mention something quickly. I'll go, yeah, hopefully, hopefully we'll end up at the right one. I think it's a bit laggy. Maybe I'll try one more time. Okay, cool. Um, so what you'll find is, I mentioned it before, um, just briefly, a lot, of, a lot of birds, and this is a kind of a generalization, but a lot of birds will shelter and nest in dense cover but actually forage in more open situations. So whether that be, say, fairy wrens that would be spending a lot of time uh, sheltering and nesting in there, they'll do a lot of foraging in the slightly more open habitats on the outside. Whether, it, you know, if, say, it's whistlers or, or thornbills or things like that, 
they'll, sh they'll use this stuff for shelter, but they'll actually get most of their food in the more open habitats. So having that dense structure abutting more open situations is actually quite a good thing. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, no, 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 absolutely, yeah, good question. So they're not going to be competing much, although noisy miners do feed on the ground. So things that are eating larger invertebrates on the ground, they will compete with them. But my, my uh, what I wanted to point out with that, the, you know, the breakdown of different types of targets is even if they're not directly competing with noisy miners, the fact that they're eliciting a response where the noisy miners have to use up energy to chase them, it's still has that little chip away kind of impact on, on them. Yeah, Obviously there, the cool, sweet. Uh, another thing that you know, we often don't think about when we're planning a site with reveg is we talk about understory and the importance of, of that, but that always seems to imply that there's gonna be trees above it. Um, and of course, trees give a structural advantage to noisy miners. So we, we should start to think of shrub cover as being its own thing, which we can actually have out in the open, not necessarily always under trees. The benefit of that is it's even less defendable for noisy miners, but also it tends to attain this denser structure when it's not struggling for resources. Um, and I think the next slide will probably go into that. Um, yeah. What I mean by that is um, there's a big difference between the density of plants and the density of a plant. Um, so there's a lot of understory planted here, but it's under a canopy of trees. Um, and all of it is just fighting for light. And also it's, um, it's, it's quite dry under there too. So things grow really leggy. And if you're a, a small bush bird trying to escape attack, there's really nowhere to hide in there, despite it actually being considered you know, dense understory because there's a a, you know, a wattle, a two wattles in every square metre. So what you'll find is um, situations like this where things actually have light hitting them, they'll grow to, to better densities. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is what I was mentioning before. So um, that's the way a, a fairy wren will use that sort of situation. Um, a brown thornbill. So this is foraging shelter so you'll see when they're when they're hard pressed by by an aggressive honey eater they'll duck down into the densest stuff um, which there's not much of directly under the trees it's getting the light that's where it's going to get the, the density and they're nesting in this sort of situation um, this was something which i thought worth mentioning because it came up at boyd park um, one of the land managers there um, said oh no well <clears throat> Um, you know, having experience in, in land management and, and wildlife ecology, you won't achieve much um, by changing the habitat in, a, in a, a thin strip like that because of the edge effect. But um, I think there's a little bit of cognitive bias going on there because we think of this, the outside, as being non-habitat just purely because it's an urban landscape and that as being the habitat because it's a green space. But as far as the small bush birds are concerned, it's the other way around. This is the gap in the usable habitat. And it's the noisy miners habitat there. Does, is that making sense? So, um, so if you start to impact on this area here, it's actually going to be easier to drive out noisy miners in a thin strip like that, surrounded by residential streets, than it will be if it's near an open bushland reserve or another park. Um, and we often think of these green spaces as corridors for these small bush birds. It's the other way around again. It's the home gardens that are providing the most usable sites now in most of our um, inner urban Melbourne areas. And the green spaces are sort of the dead zones. Um, I think I can, yeah, I could probably skip past that because I'll go into a bit more detail. George Street, that's the one I mentioned as pretty much pristine heath, just sort of pickled. Um, it's what would have covered the area before, and it certainly wouldn't have had noisy miners before. 
but it's proximity to this sort of land management on the Sandringham Golf Course that has done it in. And it shows that, um, so the noisy miners are there for the coast manor gums. Previously, they would have been fairly useless because it, it would have been full of these heathland birds um, and the ground layer not very conducive to noisy miners whatsoever. But having those eucalypts as a resource and lawn nearby, they don't actually need to overlap in space. If they're near each other, noisy miners can potentially exploit them. Um, and for that reason, I say that comment, um, that we really need to think of land management outside of the reserve system, <coughs> which doesn't have to be too hard, but this is <coughs> one way to think about it. Um, so when we tend to plant, plant natives, they often are things from other parts of Australia, not really native at all, um, native to the, the country, but not really ecologically uh, speaking. And then, of course, there's things from other continents altogether. Um, uh, and the reason I'm, I'm pointing out where they're from is that, obviously, an indigenous plant is much more likely to have close associations with the local invertebrates than a plant from somewhere else in the world. Um, and that's what kickstarts the food web, is those close associations with invertebrates. So things like this, kaikuyu grass, you'll almost never see an insect eating kaikuyu grass. You compare that to, say, weeping grass, it's got seven different butterfly species that'll lay their eggs on it. Um, I've seen common brown butterflies lay their eggs on weeping grass, oh, sorry, on kaikuyu, and they, they die because they can't eat it. Same goes for, you know, plane trees, ornamental pear trees, all the things we plant from other parts of the world. When we do plant things from other parts of Australia, the same rule sort of applies, but then we're often planting things to make it even worse, which just pump out ridiculous amounts of nectar, which is, uh, it has the, the influence of actually increasing the amount of aggression by birds in that landscape. Nectar is a reliable resource. So the biggest bully can basically win because it knows if it can keep all the competitors away, um, then it's, got, it's gonna get a reward. Insects don't really work like that. Birds have to look around for insects. They can't defend a, an insect resource necessarily. Um, so I see a lot of this. Um, that she-oak could potentially be a fantastic little stop-off point for brown thornbills, but it's defended by wattle birds um, because of the banksias. So always cramming more and more is not always gonna be the best outcome because uh, well, environments are made distinct not only by what they have, but what they don't have. And what a brown thornbill is looking for is not only those invertebrates in there being produced by that she-oak, but also a lack of, obviously, defence by, by wattlebirds. And if you've ever gone for a walk through a coast banksia woodland that's peaking in flower, you really don't see much in terms of bird diversity. You see wattlebirds, and that's about it. Um, <coughs> So having areas of distinction and really thinking about pumping out invertebrates again, more invertebrates, less, uh, less emphasis on the nectar and the sugars like lerps. This was a really interesting um, graph I thought that just shows the difference. Um, this looked at caterpillar biomass in indigenous hedgerows and introduced hedgerows. A 96% reduction, um, absolutely incredible. And um, with that in mind, globally across 16 studies, insects have declined by 45% since 1970. And we often um, think about pesticides as we should, and we think about uh, the impact of lighting as we should. But one thing that we don't think about is this. And to me, in an urban area where we've basically cleared all of the indigenous vegetation and replaced it, and actually continue to actively maintain that situation um, in a lot of cases of exotic vegetation being the norm. We don't have to get rid of all exotic vegetation, but if we can at least get some indigenous plants back into the mix, then we'll start to see an increase uh, in, in the abundance of insects in the landscape. <coughs> um, here's some just background info on why, why some plants might be particularly useful for your, um, for your cause. Common boobiella is more of a coastal plant, so you can probably ignore that if you're going to stay to the, you know, the strict EVCs of your area. But I do find it useful because it creates that dome shape that I was talking about when you give it space. 
Um, it's very drought hardy, you know, it'd be useful in some situations. And also um, it, it is quite a visual barrier. It seems that it doesn't have a super dense structure and it doesn't have spines, but it seems that nonetheless, a lot of small bush birds do stop, stop off and make a lot of use of, of common boobiella from a structural perspective. And also they forage in it too, um, because the leaves basically create a shield around the outside. Um, <clears throat> hedge wattle is probably second to, to tangled lignum in terms of the quality of, of structure. But of course, hedge wattles planted under canopy, again, are not going to function in the same way that hedge wattles out in the open where they've got um, abundant light resources. Um, but that's a lot of text there. So does anyone want me to talk about any of those Small anymore? Models. Yeah, the, um, good. Yeah, cool. Absolutely. So I should have silver wattle up there as well, probably fairly relevant out your way. Um, it seems that there's a, a big distinction between the philodonous wattles and the bipinnate wattles in, in the kind of um, the support <coughs> for the food web that they offer. So black wattle um, seems to be head and shoulders above the rest in particular, in terms of, it, it's actually host to more moths and butterflies than any, any other tree. Um, but then the research isn't even really there to say that it is likely that it is also a fantastic host for a wide variety of beetles and other insects as well. Um, there was a study by uh, Latrobe Uni um, that actually found 700 different invertebrate species on Is that right? Yeah, yeah, cool. That's awesome. That's good that that's getting out there. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was on a single tree. That wasn't just on the tree in general. That was on a single uh, individual. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, of course, pumping out no nectar at all, like drooping she oaks. So uh, having a bigger impact in turning that, that ratio um, of, of nectar to protein in the food web. Um, it hosts every single mistletoe in the Melbourne area, except for Bulloch mistletoe, which is sort of way out. To the, to the northwest anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I suppose I'll, I'll leave it there. It's something that I would really like to see used more in public spaces. One of the issues that people um, uh, say is that it's a fairly short lived tree, which is fair enough. So use it where we can and where practical. Silver wattle in you know, high use spaces is probably a pretty good alternative, especially up your way where it's you know, uh, more prevalent than it is down my way. Um, because it functions in much the same way. Uh, a lot of the wildlife that use black wattles also use silver wattles, except it lives for much longer, about 80 years, as opposed to sort of 20 to 30. Um, this is a really hopeful landscape to me because it is your classic sort of parkscape, 90% lawn, but hopping along those lawns are fairy wrens and yellow rump thornbills, and in the isolated trees, are things which disappeared in, in the Bayside area decades ago, like singing honey eaters. It's Jawbone Reserve, um, this little area here in Williamstown. So you can actually see they're very lawn heavy with the scattered trees. One of the big differences is those scattered trees are drooping she oaks and mooners. So the mooners have fantastic density, but the drooping she oaks are pumping out a really good abundance and diversity of insects and absolutely no nectar. Um, then uh, there are some uh, lagoons and they are, funnily enough, fringed by lignum. Um, it seems to be kryptonite to noisy miners, that plant. Um, and that's the breakdown, uh, the stats for jawbone. So 14 species under 60 grams, more than any other site. Um, uh, I, think, I think it might have only been beaten by um, Green's Bush, which is a huge extensive area of uh, but I could, I could be wrong on that. Anyway, either way, extremely impressive. So that just shows that we can, we can work with the kind of structure. If that's what we have to have, we can, we can tweak that. Um, you know, in terms of these park-like landscapes, we can, we can still have open areas and, and, and views and, and bring back the small bush birds. Um, and here's some of, the, uh, some of the stats. So yeah, I think I worked out the way the Yellowcat Willem Nature Reserve is at the moment, you'd need 
6,454 hectares of the Yellowcote Willem Nature Reserve, used to be the Elstonwick Park Nature Reserve, to match the 6.7 hectares of Jawbone Reserve in terms of the, um, the abundance of small bush birds. So it's absolutely incredible to me um, that these two places which seem much the same structure, um, some of the same plants and both being in Melbourne could be just worlds apart because of these slight tweaks. So if we start applying those slight tweaks in a, an intelligent way, we can see huge benefits uh, in my opinion. And um, yeah, that's the last slide.